What is up guys? Welcome back to Tidal Gardens. If you're new to this channel, Tidal Gardens is a coral farm located in Copley, Ohio, and here we pretty much talk about all things coral reef related. A lot of folks are getting into propagation and fragging corals, and I wanted to give some insight onto what I would consider like an ideal frag tank system. I kind of have a little bit of experience in this regard, and so perhaps you guys can learn from some of my past mistakes. Number one, let's talk about Eurobraces. There's been a trend towards rimless tanks, mainly for the aesthetics of a rimless tank. They're very cool looking, they're very elegant, but when you talk about a tank that you're gonna have to be working in all the time, you really want to consider going with a Eurobrace. So what is a Eurobrace? It's basically a section of glass that goes around the perimeter of the top. So what are the big benefits to this? The number one big benefit is that you can set stuff on it. Now that sounds like really obvious, but after having worked with a couple of rimless tanks, you really will miss being able to set something right on your glass tank's rim. The next thing is when you go to start to scrape the glass or anything like that with a rimless tank, guys with rimless tanks, you know this is true, you're gonna put a wave into that water and that wave, if you're too aggressive with your maintenance, is going to come cascading over the sides of the tank. That problem is pretty much completely eliminated once you have that Eurobrace. A side benefit is that the whole tank becomes structurally a lot stronger. Generally speaking, given the normal dimensions of a frag system, it doesn't come into play big time, but I could see a situation where a tank might be constructed out of very thin glass or something like that, where a Eurobrace would provide some structural stability. Lastly, to a very small degree, it helps keep your fish in the tank. Fish love to jump, and that little bit of Eurobrace sometimes will prevent them from getting out of the tank. Second thing, let's talk about the ideal height of one of these frag tanks. We've tried tanks that are fairly short, about 12 inches in height, and we've tried them much, much taller even. But most of our systems now are about 15 inches. And I think that's in kind of like the sweet spot as far as tank heights go. Because I think anything under 12 inches is probably too too short. Uh, the fish look a little bit constricted swimming around in anything less than 12 inches. We've even noticed a lot of our frags that are growing upwards towards the water will start to like bend because <laughs> it's just too short. Same thing with, with larger corals such as gorgonians or large leathers. You'll really want to take advantage of some additional depth. Also, deeper tanks allow you to avoid some of the splashing issues that might result from power heads and really strong return lines that might start sucking in air. I would say that anything between 15 to 18 inches is probably gonna be ideal for you. Anything deeper than 18 inches might start to become a little bit of a maintenance nightmare, especially if you're talking about a wider tank where you have to kind of like reach in maybe like three feet and then down 18 inches. I consider that Goldilocks zone from being about uh, 12 to 12 to 18 inches, let's say. And so I split it in my latest systems at about 15 inches. Tip number three pertains to lighting. I'm not going to be talking about the different lighting technologies or anything like that. If you're a T5 guy, if you're a metal halide guy, if you're an LED guy, whichever you choose. They all pretty much work just fine for growing and coloring up corals these days. My whole discussion for lighting as it pertains to frag tanks is how high they're gonna be mounted from the water. Unlike a display tank or a show tank, these frag systems are work tanks. You're gonna be in and around these tanks all the time. If you find yourself having to constantly move lights away in order to do maintenance, to like grab corals out constantly, to be propagating stuff, to be constantly cleaning frag plugs and everything like that in the water, people sometimes do that. You're gonna want to have lighting that is always out of the way. So sometimes people ask, why do we have our lights so high above the water? It's like, aren't you losing intensity? 
Yes, we are. But that is a very small sacrifice for the ease of maintenance in and around those tanks. Like basically, they are never in your headspace. When you're designing your frag system, keep that in mind. These are work tanks. You don't want to be in a situation where you're battling your equipment to get into your systems. Given that you're going to have to have higher mounting lighting, you will run into some issues as far as intensity and coverage goes. When you're selecting your lighting fixtures, kind of just have that in the back of your head that you might have to go with slightly more intense lighting. And to get the coverage that you're looking for, you might want to go with additional fixtures. For example, in our 10 foot long tanks, we decided to go with six radions rather than the bare bones three fixtures that might have been okay-ish for coverage. We wanted just a little bit more intensity and we wanted more angles of lighting spread. So LED guys, you know that LEDs kind of suffer from shading issues when there's not enough coverage. With diffusers and additional fixtures, you kind of fix all those downsides, but it does obviously come with the cost of additional fixtures. But I digress. The main point is mount them high so they're out of your way. Number four, choose your fish wisely. I tend to prefer highly utilitarian fish. So pretty much every fish that goes into one of the frag systems has a job. I like good herbivores. Mainly I like fox faces, but you do have to watch out. Sometimes they do get nibbly on certain LPS and things like that. I do like a lot of pest control as kind of like a preventative I like to keep a healthy supply of wrasses and damsels. And now I've even transitioned to like mandarins and scooter blennies to pretty much eradicate a lot of like the micro, micro, micro fauna that tends to like build their little mucus tunnels in and around the bases of corals and stuff like that that kind of prevents their growth, things like that. So lots of pod predation, lots of algae control. If you have an issue with Aptasia, you can probably also think of getting a copper band butterfly if your system is large enough to handle it. Fifth tip in this list. Let's talk about the material that's making up your tank to begin with. When we first started, we started off with Rubbermaid stock tanks because pretty much they were cheap. They were less than a dollar per gallon. Anytime you have a, a structure that is less than a dollar per gallon, you're doing pretty good. The problem is, Coral propagation is a long-term game. You will really want to be able to observe what's going on in your water. When you have a tank that you can only look top down through the surface, there's some issues with that. There's a lot of surface agitation, and that really obscures your ability to do this observation. Also, you're not really able to see the corals from the side. And there's a lot of crazy stuff that can be happening on like the underside of corals that you really want to be paying attention to. If it were me, I would wait and either get a glass or acrylic tank rather than something like a fiberglass stock tank, some type of raceway like that, or a Rubbermaid stock tank. If it's all you can start off with, I get it. I was in that same boat, but again, long term, you'll want to migrate to something that you can see through the sides. Now, as far as acrylic, versus glass. I am all in on glass. My issues with acrylic mainly have to do with how easily they scratch. Like coralline algae can bore very easily into it. Acrylic is weird. It There are some benefits. So supposedly it's a little bit more vibration resistant. So if like you live in an earthquake zone, that might be preferable to glass, but I'll get back to that in a second. It is more thermally insulating. It is clearer Having had a couple of just uh, some quarantine systems downstairs that are made of acrylic, they get damaged in the weirdest ways imaginable. Like for example, I had like this cord from a power head and it happened to be like resting up against the edge of the quarantine tank. And just the vibration of this cord over time started to cut through the Euro brace of this acrylic tank. I can't even make this stuff up. So yeah, if you look at your acrylic tank wrong, you're putting scratches into it. That's kind of like why I decided to go with glass tanks pretty much across the board. Now going back to the whole like vibration and earthquake resistance of acrylic, 
I was all in on that. So I would always recommend like, guys, if you live in California, you probably want to get an acrylic tank. But I have a friend in Tokyo. And if you know anything about Tokyo, you know about earthquakes pretty much every day. He built tanks out of quarter inch thick glass and had no problems in Tokyo. My tanks in Ohio are three quarter inches. So it's three times the thickness with armored braces and everything like that. I'm never gonna have a problem. So given my latest experiences with glass tanks and how strong they really are, I would pretty much skip acrylic altogether for this. Next up, number six. It's this constant debate of whether you should go with a single level or double level tanks or triple level, however many, multi-level versus single level. I understand that if you're starting out in a very tight, constricted space. You have to really maximize that space. Obviously, you could double or triple your production capacity in a given space by going vertical with it. However, at scale, if you have like a giant warehouse to work with, you are gonna really want single level. Single level at scale is king. So why is this? There is an optimal height to work in these systems. And trust me, at scale, you will have to do a lot of work in these systems, a lot of observation, because when you start to have multiple levels, just that little slight inefficiency as to the ideal height that you're working in is going to breed some bad habits, let's just say. There's plenty of examples where there's like a triple decker system and pretty much the staff will work on that middle one. The top one kind of gets ignored, bottom one definitely gets ignored. What happens when a coral farm starts to neglect certain tanks, that is where all your problematic stuff is gonna be growing. All your really weird flatworms and nudibranchs that just start to eat corals, any number of like really bad pests are going to survive and go crazy in these neglected tanks. For us, we've pretty much designed all of our systems now to be a single level. But again, if you're working in a very small tight space, a closet or whatever, yes, I understand, maximize it. But if you're only talking about like three tanks in like a triple decker thing, you could probably handle that and not run into quite as much neglect issues. But let's say if you're working with like a hundred aquariums, yeah, spread that out, single. Okay. My last tip, number seven, it's something that we don't even do here because this is, again, kind of an aspirational, idealized system. So you know how farmers do a crop rotation where they will leave one field follow and then the next season plant in that? There are some benefits to doing something similar with frag systems. Problematic stuff can kind of linger in a tank. A lot of our frag systems, they stay up for like 10 years. And so these kind of like the chronic weirdness, chronic issues just kind of hang out for the entire decade and just never go away. Some of it is like, it's not world breaking. I mean, you're gonna still run a perfectly successful farm without doing anything crazy. But if you can do something crazy, kind of a crop rotation could be very, very beneficial. So what do I mean? It would be cool to be able to set aside one tank that's pretty much drained and polished out clean and every month you take one of your existing tanks move over all your stuff cap catch all your fish move them over and then take that tank and drain it all down fill it with fresh water scrub that thing out completely clean and then the next month after that do that rotation move the next tank over clean out that one so we don't do that here because our systems are have basically four frag tanks. So if I were to leave one of those things follow, I'm losing 25% of my productivity. Now, if my systems were though 12 tanks, now if I left one follow, I'm only losing what, 8.3-ish percent? I might give up 8.3% production for the benefits of basically hard resetting a tank every month. So 12 tanks once a month. It only takes maybe one afternoon to make that switch over. I could see some major benefits to that. So again, we don't quite have that scale in order to do a one month crop rotation, but 
I could see maybe down the road, if I ever get larger, how I would design my systems in groups of 12 to do exactly that. And obviously, when moving the corals from one tank to the other, that's a perfectly good opportunity to give it a quick dip, yada, yada, yada. OK, guys, that was my top seven list, it turns out, on things that I would look for in an ideal frag system. Hopefully, you guys picked up a tip or two. All right, guys, that's it from here. Until next time, happy reefing.